I hope you're getting the message today that it's all about Jesus. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. I wonder what that means for you. There's words, but then there is uh, something that's very unique and significant for ourselves. What does it mean? What is God asking of you? What does it look like for you to give your soul, to give your life, to give your all? Well, uh, as you are aware, um, and from our Bible reading as well, we are... Uh, reading through Colossians, so we are going to spend the next few weeks looking at Colossians, and it's entitled First, One, Crown, First, that Jesus will be first in all of our lives, because that's the place that he deserves. A question I often ask in different situations during the week when I'm with a group of people is, where did you see God at work this week? Where did you see God at work in your life, in your situation this week? So have a little think. You may be sitting next to somebody that you know, so you can share with them. You may be sitting next to somebody that you don't know. So first of all, you might just like to say, hi, my name is, and this is where I saw God at work this week. So just five minutes. Where did you see God at work this week? His provision for you or his faithfulness or in some situation, where did you see God at work? So off you go, five minutes to chatter. How good is it to hear that there is obviously in each of our lives uh, instances or evidence of God at work. So that is uh, a way that we bring praise to God by the words of our mouth that give glory and honour to him in whatever situations we've faced this week. We might ask that question on a regular basis, so don't be scared be uh, excited at having the opportunity to share where you've seen God at work and to uh, give praise when you see him at work in other people's lives as well. As I look around the room, I see a number of people who are wearing glasses. How many of those who are wearing glasses need it for reading? How many need it for distance seeing? So some people are both. (laughs) So you are the multifocal people, or there could be another word for it. Some of us um, perhaps go through life a little bit happy to just keep squinting when the writing gets a little bit small. Is there anyone who does that? You just... uh, You can't quite see, so you squint, and apparently that's meant to help you see a little bit better. Not so sure. Oh, Greg, that's you. Well, let me tell you, Greg, that uh, there are people who can help you to stop squinting, and you can see life and things a whole lot better if you go and visit this person. Now, I, I have done this a few years ago, and for some of you, you've probably never ever seen that I have these glasses I know, Scott, it's shocking. The only problem is if I put them on here, I can't really see you people. You're very blurry. But that's what it looks like for me. Why did I not go sooner? Maybe a bit of pride. Maybe a bit of I can't be needing glasses. Um, But they certainly make a difference when I read Things that are very small, it's like, oh my goodness, look at that. I don't have to strain my eyes. And this may sound really silly, but if I'm working at home um, and I have them on and then Frankie comes along, it's like, wow, look at all those little bits of hair that I can see that I couldn't see before on him. Frankie is our dog. When you go to the optometrist, you uh, get to have such fun 
doing a test, an eye test. How many people love tests in general, like written tests? Some people love them. Paul, is that the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Okay, so Paul loves to do tests. Very good. Some of our young adults uh, have been doing uni exams recently. So how many of you love writing down, answering tests? Most of us don't. It's a bit of a pressure. I kind of feel when I've been to the optometrist that it's also a pressure test. Um, because they put this thing before my eyes. So let's have a look. You've probably seen this before. It's a chart. Anyone seen that before? What's the top letter? Everybody always gets E right. Let's see if we can read the next line. F, P, I think it's pretty easy when it's on the big screen. T, O, Z, L, P, E, D, but that's a funny looking E and so on and so on. Have you ever got to the point where you're really confident to start off with and then as you go down the line and the letters get smaller, you start to squint and you're like, uh, E, O, oh no, no, that wasn't an O, it was something else because you're trying to convince the optometrist that you don't actually need glasses. Now that one there, was that the blurry one, Scott? It doesn't look so blurry from here, um, but let's get the next slide. See how it comes into focus. Um, pardon? You couldn't? Oh, wow, that's why they give us glasses to help us to see the letters. But what a difference it makes when things are blurry to when things are sharp. That's the good part about glasses. Uh, one of the things that I feel the pressure of is when they put these lenses in front of your eyes and they say, which is better, one or two? One or two? And I'm like, I don't know if I'm answering the right thing because I'm not sure if it's sharper or if it's a little bit blurry. Well, the optometrists uh, help us to see what's going on with our eyes. And the most exciting part is when they do put a lens over your eyes and they give you this laminated piece of paper and you're able to read what's right down the very bottom. It's just really sharp and in focus. I wonder if uh, we sometimes think or we actually recognize that sometimes our focus of Jesus is blurred. It gets blurry and we don't see him as clearly as uh, we should be able to. Well, Paul wrote to the Colossians. Um, that's the letter. If you have your Bible, I encourage you to open up to the book of Colossians because we will go through some of these verses and some will be on the screen. But it's, uh, it's really good to be able to have our Bibles, whether they are paper, whether they're technical, um, just to have something that we can refer to. And Scott spoke last week that Paul wrote to the Colossians about the supremacy and the sufficiency of Jesus. Now this church was a young church in the sense that it hadn't been established for very long. And uh, the people who went there were new to salvation. They were new to following Jesus. And their faith had come under attack from false teachers who said Jesus alone was not enough for salvation. They were actually being pressured to conform to the beliefs and the practices of their pagan neighbours and the Jews themselves. And the environment that they lived in was threatening the purity of the gospel of Jesus. A blurry Jesus is what they were seeing. So let's have a look at the next slide. Somewhere in there is the word Jesus. And you could probably make out the shape because it resembles the shape of the word Jesus here. But there are things in our lives that make it hard for us to see Jesus clearly. And they could be some of the things that were the same as those who were in this church. The traditions 
of a church sometimes take prominence over Jesus. The rituals, the culture, behavior, myself, contemporary thought, maybe misinformation about Jesus, maybe things that challenge us in life when we get hurt. Sometimes we get hurt by the church, by people in the church, by difficulty or adversity. These are things that can blur our vision of Jesus. Our faith gets threatened, and while we might begin our Christian journey with a clear focus of Jesus, it's easy to let other things, like all of those things here, blur our vision. Some practices or traditions or rituals can say that unless you do this, your salvation is not secure. Jesus plus doing this or this or this ensures your salvation. The challenges that we have in life uh, threaten our ability to see that Jesus actually does love us and that he is greater and has more power than any of those situations. So as we uh, read through this part of Colossians, and actually as we go through the whole book, we're going to see that the greatest need we have is to renew our vision of Jesus and to see him clearly, to crown him as Lord of all. As we travel through Colossians, this part helps us to get a clear perspective of Jesus and to know who he is so that when we get to those relationships that are in our life, we know how to live them through the lens of Jesus and not through the lens of the world and what the world says. So we're going to look at Colossians 1 uh, verses 15 to 23. But I want to ask you a question. If somebody came up to you and said, who is Jesus? I know, a tough question. Who is Jesus? How would you answer that? Have a little think in your mind. Because somebody today may come up to you and say, Fiona, tell me, who's Jesus? You may not be expecting that question. How would you answer somebody who asked you, who is Jesus? It's not a dumb question. It's a significant question. It's significant because you know who Jesus is. And I'm trusting that the person out there who, does, who asks you that question is someone who is really seeking to know who Jesus is. Well, Jesus is the living expression of God himself. He's active in creation. He holds it together. He was first. He is first in existence, in power, in position. He has first place in God's new creation and his new people, which is called the church. He brought it into being. He is the head. Through his death, it is possible for us to be reconciled with God. That's the good news of the gospel. Now, if you ask me who is Jesus and I hit you with all of those words, you're probably going to go, I will never ask her another question because she just went bang with a whole lot of information. Sort of a bit like what Paul does here in this part of Colossians. Part of that gets a little bit confusing because he just keeps saying statement after statement after statement of who Jesus is. But that's not uh, something that we should shy away from and go, I don't understand. We need to know who Jesus is. You need to know who Jesus is. I need to know who Jesus is because we are the ones who take him out there into the world and shine the light for others. We don't have to know all the head knowledge. We actually need to know it in heart and in behavior as well. My Jesus, I love thee. I know you are mine. I will get rid of everything else to put you as first in my life. So Paul writes uh, to these Colossian Christians and he is basically encouraging them to live Jesus-centered lives. Don't listen to what the other teachers are saying about what you need to live for Jesus or what brings salvation. You just need Jesus. It is simple. 
The way we live our lives as followers of Jesus is very revealing of how clearly we see Jesus. How clearly we see him is revealed in how we live our life. And as I said, later on in Colossians, there is a lot about how people behave and and treat each other. And with Jesus in clear focus, the pure gospel message, then it will be seen in the way we behave. So I'm going to go through these verses quickly. I'm just going to bring out each uh, phrase or word that Paul writes. I want to encourage you to study this a little bit more for yourself. Don't just take what is said here. On our website, there are always discussion questions. You can Google any sort of Bible study discussion questions and and take yourself on a bit of a deeper journey as well. So I want to encourage you to do that. So the first thing that Paul says is Jesus is the image of the invisible God in verse 15. Jesus isn't just a man. He is more than a man. He is the image of the invisible God. So if you want to know what God is like, Look at Jesus. Look in the Bible to see how Jesus lived his life. That's how you know what God is like. People couldn't see God, but they could see Jesus. And by looking at Jesus, we get a clear picture of who God is and what he's like. Jesus made the invisible God visible. Not just because we saw this person He actually made God who was invisible, who was unknowable at that point in time, he made him known. He revealed himself to his people through Jesus. How many of you are the firstborn in your family? Pardon? The firstborn child to your parents. Yes, Scott. Did anyone think anything different out there? (laughs) It's like the firstborn in your family, yes. So the firstborn child, you bore the responsibility for your younger siblings. Was that the truth? You were told to look after them. They got away with stuff that you did not get away with. Did that happen? Yeah, apparently I was the second born, so I was the one who got away with the stuff that the first born did not get away with. Well, in Colossians 16, it says that Jesus is the first born of all creation. And he's not talking about first born in the way we just talked about it, because uh, the term back then, first born, was actually about rank or supremacy. The firstborn got the wealth. Be excited, firstborns, be excited. You got the wealth. You got the status. You got the standing of your father. And there's a theologian called Michael Bird who says that Jesus is the firstborn does not make him a created being. To call Jesus firstborn is to say something of his primacy in rule, preeminence in role, and priority in rank. He was not created, he is firstborn. There is nobody above Jesus. Nobody ranks higher than Jesus. He is supreme. And when it comes to God, Jesus shows us what God is like. When he comes to creation, he is all over it. He's the highest over everyone and everything. Nothing and nobody is better than Jesus. Paul says this because the Colossians were being told misinformation that Jesus was not powerful. He was not enough. You needed this from here and you needed to do that. Jesus was not enough. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. Now that probably could have just landed on you like a, oh, perhaps. But let's have a look at it again. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him 
and for him. Jesus is not just another creature, another created thing. Jesus is the creator. He is not created. Everything exists because he made it. When we read back in Genesis chapter 1, or when you know Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, Paul is actually telling us now to understand that it was God the Son, Jesus, who created heaven and earth. Because Jesus is created in the image of God. He is the image of God. He has made known who God is to us. There is no doubt that Jesus is the author of all creation. And when we understand that, we can worship him better. We can worship him and honour him all the more. One of the things that uh, was a thought that came into the Colossian church from the teachers out there in the pagan world was that angels were greater than Jesus. And they were the mediators, the in-betweeners between God and man, angels. And they were worshipping angels. And here Paul says he is above all things whether they are dominions, thrones, dominions, or rulers of authority or authorities, he is above all things. Ultimately, everything in creation answers to God, answers to Jesus. So do you need anything else apart from Jesus for your life? No. Jesus is Lord over every aspect of our life. Verse 17 says, he's before all things and in him all things hold together. Every bit of you looks like it's held together by your skin. Well, Jesus gave you that skin to hold everything together. Everything in here is made up of something that is being held together by Jesus. If Jesus stopped holding all things together, you and I would cease to exist. Jesus is supreme. He's the creator, the sustainer of the universe. And he's the head of the church. The church does not exist to uh, meet the needs of its members. If we go to the next slide, the church does not exist to meet the needs of the members. I'm sorry to tell you. The church is the body of Christ. It doesn't exist to meet your needs or my needs. All the needs of the general of the Salvation Army or anybody. The church exists because we are to fulfill the redemptive purpose of Jesus. We are to speak of Jesus. That's why we exist. Jesus directs the church, he governs the church, and he gives it life and he gives it strength. We exist to honour Jesus. Verses uh, 19 to 20 are a bit long. Again, going over, he is the beginning, the firstborn. In him, everything might be preeminent, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. How many of you have been told you look like your mother or your father? Your actions, your mannerisms are like your mother or your father. The way you walk, the things you do, the things you say, you are like your mother or your father. You'll be pleased to know and I will be pleased to know that the fullness of my mother does not live in me. The fullness of Jesus, the fullness of God lives in Jesus. Jesus lives in me. The reason Jesus came in this particular verse was reconciliation. He came to heal the rift and to bridge the gap between God and man, between you and me and God. The initiative was God's. It was God who began the whole process of salvation. It was because God so loved the world that he sent his son His one object in sending his son was to call us back to him, 
to reconcile all things to himself. I hope you're getting a picture that Jesus is amazing, that he is powerful, he is all sufficient, that he deserves first place in each of our lives. Through uh, this particular verse, in him, through him, to him. If you remember nothing else this morning, these three phrases, in him, Jesus, through him, Jesus, to him, Jesus. That's God's at work. It was through the cross. It was Jesus' blood that was shed on the cross. And in that instance, God said, I love you so much that I will see, I will give my son to die for you. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. If the cross does not hit you here and does not challenge any behaviour that's in you that is putting Jesus over to the side, I'm not sure what will. It's the cross of Jesus that demands our soul, our life, our all. So what are we meant to do? Well, Paul actually tells us in these last few verses in 21 to 23, he said, you were once alienated and you were hostile in your mind. And you might go, no, I wasn't. I've always been thinking about God. But without God reconciling us to him, we are alienated. We have been isolated. We are hostile in our behaviours. He has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, became a minister." How do you respond to all that Jesus is? Well, you make sure that it's true of you, that you have moved from being, an, from being alienated from God to being reconciled to God because that is what God has sent Jesus to do for you. When you see Jesus in all of his glory, it only makes sense to trust him, to give your life to him. He invites you. He welcomes you. We've been reconciled to God to live a life that bears fruit and is continually being transformed into the likeness of Jesus. Earlier on, we had a blurry chart of Jesus with a whole lot of life stuff. When we understand or when we believe that this is who God is, who Jesus is, we get a clear picture of Jesus. Now, some of those words, you might go, oh, well, I don't really quite understand what they're all about. The one that stands out for me is Redeemer. Jesus is my Redeemer. He has reconciled me to God. If all things... If Jesus, sorry, is the image of God and all the fullness of God lives in Jesus, then you will not find fullness in anything else apart from Jesus. If all things visible, invisible, in heaven and earth were created by him, then Jesus is greater than all of those things and they will not destroy us. The challenges that you face in life will not destroy your soul because Jesus is greater. God's plan from before creation was to reconcile all things through Jesus. Nothing else will save us or bring us reconciliation. Jesus is supreme overall and his supremacy manifests itself most visibly in the church. If we lose connection with the head of the church, Jesus, we will wither and die spiritually. 
The supremacy of Jesus over the whole universe assures us believers of the sufficiency of Jesus. Don't allow your hope in Jesus to be shaken when it is challenged or insulted by others. He is who he says he is. If Jesus sustains the universe and keeps all of that going, guess what? He can sustain you as well. So I want to encourage you to continue in the faith. That's what Paul said. Be stable and steadfast. Don't deviate from the gospel. Don't get sidetracked by anything else. You don't need anything other than Jesus because there's no one and nothing better than Jesus. I pray today that what you have heard is that Jesus is all you need. You don't need to know a whole lot of stuff. You don't need to do certain things. Your salvation is found in Jesus. Invite uh, the music team to come. And they're going to uh, bring a song that again reminds us of some of these words that we have read about. It says, what gift of grace is Jesus my redeemer? There's no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to his. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing, all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Today, the message is that Jesus is enough for you. Maybe you heard that a long time ago. Maybe you've never heard that before. But I want you to know that Jesus is enough for you. For whatever is going on in your life, Jesus is enough. He is more than enough. And I also want you to know that there is nothing that you can do that ensures your salvation except coming to Jesus and saying, I repent. And I recognise that your death on the cross was to pay the penalty for my sin and to bring me back into relationship with God. There is nothing else that you need to do for that very first step of coming to God. I don't know whether the world has told you different things. I don't know if other people have said you need to do X, Y and Z. That's not what I've read in Scripture. What I've read in Scripture is that Jesus has done it all. And as this song is sung, if you know it or you don't know it, the words are going to be very powerful for you. But maybe there is something in your own mind that you need to say, well, Jesus, I'm so sorry because I do not make you supreme in my life. I have this and I have this and this and I like to do things my own way. But Jesus deserves the first place in your life. And today, maybe you want to come and you would want to come here. Prayer is something that we do in this church. Encouraging each other is something that we do in this church. Praying for each other is something that we do in this space as well. And whilst we have these uh, material places here, the power is not in the wood The power is in the one who holds the wood all together, which is Jesus. So I would invite you, if you wanted to come and you wanted to pray today, if you want to have somebody pray for you, then somebody will come and pray. But for each one of us, may we not leave this place today recognising that there is something or someone else who's actually in the place of Jesus. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. What an honour to journey with Jesus, to be the one who recognises He is my Redeemer. So I encourage you to respond 
Respond to God today. Respond to the Spirit. Father God, we thank You for the power of Your Word. We thank You that it is truth. It is Your living Word inspired by the Holy Spirit. And I thank You for Your Holy Spirit who continues to do a work in us, to bring these words alive in us. I thank You that today we've had the opportunity to look at Jesus and to get a clear, sharp focus on who He is. And I thank You, God, for the work that You have done in people's lives in drawing them closer to You. God, may each one of us know that our hope is in You, that there is nothing more we need to add to Jesus to ensure our salvation. We need faith. We need to remain firm. And through Jesus, we can do that. So today we give the glory to You, God. We thank You for the hope that comes in Jesus. And until our last breath, Jesus is the hope of glory in us. Amen. A benediction from 2 Thessalonians and it's verse, uh, chapter 1, sorry, verse 11 and 12. With this in mind, pray that God will empower you to live worthy of all that he has invited you to experience. And pray that by his power, all the pleasures of goodness and all works inspired by faith would fill you completely. By doing this, the name of our Lord Jesus will be glorified in you and you will be glorified in him by the marvellous grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless.